Hello everyone, uh, I'm Ivan Pieplniak and uh, if anyone wants to know more about me, this is the about slide and I will just skip it because you have URL at the bottom and I will not bore you with these details. Some of you may know me for the books I was writing 20 years ago and you would be right saying, well, isn't this the MPLS guy and why is he talking about clouds today? And yeah, I totally believe that. And I totally believe that clouds, public clouds anyway, is something that developers care about and networking engineers shouldn't. And anyway, a friend of mine made a joke in 2013 saying, well, you know, AWS is making as much money as IBM is making with AS400. Seven years later, AWS is making 75 times more money per quarter. And well, I don't know if anyone is still using AS400. I'm sure people are, but anyway, public cloud is serious business. And uh, unfortunately, a lot of public cloud involves networking because you have to set up things and you have to connect people back home and you have to connect your users to the public cloud. And as you will see in a minute, it all looks like Alice in Wonderland when you start exploring how that thing works. It's bizarre. And anyway, the best way to learn how a bizarre thing works for me is to start teaching about it because, you know, you get all these crazy questions and then you slowly figure out why they did things the way they did because there is someone that actually needs that feature. And so we put together this uh, online course uh, targeting networking engineers who should understand how clouds really work. And uh, so far it worked really well. Uh, Yet again, you can check that on our website if you wish. Uh, I'll just go through what I learned when I was preparing this stuff. Brief warning, uh, if you are working for a large web property, you will probably not hear anything new, so you should go and have a beer right now. If you already deployed an application across three or four major public clouds, uh, well, this is not for you. You know more about this stuff than I do. Go have a beer. On the other hand, if you are just exploring how these things work, well, maybe I will be able to help you a little bit. And uh, I did use the uh, illustrations from Alice in Wonderland because this is really a weird land we are entering. Things don't work the way we expect them to work. Because First, in no sane public cloud will you find extensive layer two. People who are emulating sane public clouds with VMware simply don't count. They usually stay small because VMware honestly can't scale beyond 1,000 hosts unless you go for multi vCenter deployment and then you have multiple regions or what have you. So Anyone who wants to go beyond that usually quickly figures out that layer two is a toxic environment, which uh, enterprise people don't want to believe. But if you want to go to public cloud, you have to forget all your layer two tricks. And then obviously the yammering starts like, oh my God, how am I supposed to move the virtual machines? Well, you won't. You can't move a virtual machine in a public cloud. You kill it, you restart it somewhere else. Get used to it. How will I implement high availability clusters? Oh, good luck with that. The only way to do it sanely is to use a built-in load balancer. How will I deploy firewall clusters? Well, maybe you shouldn't. Because they do have, every single public cloud provider has some sort of access control list and some sort of web application firewall. So maybe you should start dealing with what they have instead of bringing your own stuff with you and polluting the brand new deployment. And finally, there are vendors who are promising heaven on earth and it works so well in their PowerPoint slide decks migrating workloads from on-premises data centers into a public cloud. And VMware is particularly fond of demonstrating how you can vMotion, how you can move a running virtual machine from your data center into VMware on AWS. And for people performing those stunts, I have just one simple question. Have you ever heard of latency? 
Because if you increase the latency from microseconds that you have in your data center to milliseconds that you need to reach the public cloud, what do you think will happen to your application performance? Obviously, they never listen, so we'll not go there. What I want to do now is compare two most common public clouds, namely AWS and Azure. They both look almost the same, and yet inside they are fundamentally different. But they both have these isolated tenant routing domains. One of them calls them VPCs, the other one calls them VNets. They both have subnets. Now here's the first interesting difference. For AWS, a subnet is, a, is within a single availability zone. So a subnet either works or doesn't work. For Azure, a subnet stretches multiple availability zones. So you are already in that weird scenario. Hmm, what if half of my subnet is dead? What do I do? Next, you can't just make up a MAC or IP address and have it accepted. All the MAC addresses, all the IP addresses are assigned by the orchestration system. They are managed by the orchestration system and they are strictly checked. All public clouds perform extremely strict MAC and IP source address checking. They can be disabled. So if you want to run a load balancer or a firewall, you can. But by default, everything is strictly checked. And you can't just run a routing protocol with a public cloud router. The only way to change the routing is to do API calls in their orchestration system. So what does this mean? You can't just deploy, for example, a firewall or a load balancer cluster and hope to use the good old layer two tricks. You cannot just move an IP address to another machine and issue a gratuitous ARP and hope that it works. You can't use VRRP, you can't use HSRP, you can't use GLBP or what have you. So most of the high availability hacks that you're used to simply won't work. Even worse, you cannot run a routing protocol within the cloud. You can run BGP with the cloud if you are doing it from the outside, from your VPN concentrator or from your router, if you have a leased line into one of these public clouds. But within the cloud, they won't listen to you. So you can BGP all you want or you can run unicast OSPF because they don't support multicast. Nothing will happen. Forget about it. The only way, and some people are doing that, and it's totally crazy, so don't. The only way to influence routing in a public cloud is to scan the routing table on your router and use API calls to transfer that into the routing table of the cloud router. It works reasonably well on AWS, and it totally fails on Azure because Azure orchestration system is so slow. So every API call on Azure can take a second or two. Now imagine you have like uh, 100 routes in the routing table and they change. Uh, well, good luck updating the routing table of Azure uh, router that is actually forwarding your packets. Now it gets even more interesting. As I mentioned, in AWS, subnet is an availability zone and they support unicast IPv4 and IPv6 forwarding and they do have now some limited IPv4 multicast support. Now, interestingly, both environments support Ethernet packets because that's what you get out of a server. You deploy a server, the server must think it has an Ethernet NIC. An Ethernet NIC is sending Ethernet frames. And uh, AWS gives you MAC forwarding within the subnet. So within the subnet, they're actually listening to MAC addresses, but there is no layer two flooding. So there is no uh, unknown unicast flooding. There is no broadcast or multicast, but unicast MAC forwarding works, which is interesting, but that's the only way you can change the packet forwarding within an AWS VPC instance. Each subnet, can have a different route table. That's also interesting. So each subnet behaves a bit like a VRF, but there is no way to influence intra VPC packet forwarding. So if server A on my picture is sending a packet to server C, there is 
absolutely no way that you could intercept that packet and send it through B. Apart from a dirty trick that you configure a static route on A for C pointing to B, and because A and B are in the same subnet and they use MAC-based forwarding within the subnet, the packet will actually go that way. Now, good luck getting the return traffic going the same way. The only way to do that is to change the source IP address of the, of the packet going from B to C, which means that we are back in Netland. Hooray, the great duct tape of networking is back. You want to get packet forwarding in AWS working the way you want, you have to use NAT. So service insertion is really, really, really interesting. And honestly, don't. It's not worth the effort. If you get into the situation where you have to start thinking about service insertion in AWS VPC, or where you have to start thinking about net tricks to influence packet forwarding, your design stinks. And the only way to fix a stinging design is to go back to the business problem and redesign the whole thing. Don't try to use the nerd knobs and all sorts of crazy clutches because eventually they will bite you. And do keep in mind that these people, AWS and Azure, they live in a different universe from you. They don't have to respect all the rules that we've learned in various CCNA level courses, how Ethernet and IP works. They do stuff their own way and uh, they can change the way they do stuff. And AWS did change the way they did stuff. Initially, they were working exactly like Azure and now they change into this mixed layer, two layer, three model. So if you base your design on a certain dirty trick that works today, it may break tomorrow and they will not even warn you because the only thing they guarantee is that their API will work. So keep that in mind. Now for Azure, uh, here the subnets span availability zones and uh, that makes it really hard to deploy things like a swim lane uh, so-called swim lane where you have like a web server and an app server and a database server in one availability zone and a parallel stack in a different availability zone. It's possible. It takes way more effort than with AWS and you have to use at least for load balancers and things like that zonal instances. Uh, Azure obviously wasn't pressed enough to implement multicast. Someone must have really shown AWS a huge purchase order to persuade them to implement IPv4 multicasting. Uh, so Azure is still supporting only IPv4 and IPv6 unicast forwarding. Even worse, Azure is only forwarding ICMP, TCP and UDP packets which means that you can't even cheat with GRE tunnels. GRE tunnels without, within Azure don't work. GRE tunnels between your on-premises router and your router instance in Azure don't work. Uh, I'm not sure about IPsec, but I wouldn't be surprised if you would be required to use IPsec over UDP to make it work between your on-premises device and a router instance. Now, obviously, if you're running IPsec with their VPN concentrator, it's a different story because there, they support the proper IPsec. Now, Azure does something really interesting. They don't care about layer two. So it looks like every instance, every VM would have a direct connection to a layer three port on their router. The ARP request always returns the same MAC address. It's something like 12345678AB or something, or the other way around. Uh, so you have multiple virtual machines in the same subnet. They have IP addresses from the same subnet. So you ARP for their MAC addresses, and they're all the same. Uh, likewise, uh, as with AWS, each subnet could have a different route table, but in Azure, the route tables could contain prefixes that are more specific than the CIDR block that you assigned to 
Azure uh, VNet, which means that you can do intra VNet traffic uh, steering and service assertion. It's really easy to do it. It's also messy. So yet again, even though you could, maybe you shouldn't. Uh, so now you've seen how different they are, even though you know on the high level architecture pictures, they all look the same. Uh, Google is doing a mix of this two and something different again. And then you have the Oracle Cloud and the IBM Cloud and the VMware-based clouds, which still support all the layer two tricks and so on and so on. So it, as a networking engineer, it's not just like you would have to deal with Cisco and Juniper and Arista. It's like uh, Cisco's and Juniper's implementation of OSPF would be totally different. And now it's your turn to tell me that they are, but let's not go there. They're not as different as what we get here. So obviously any networking engineer trying to remain sane should ask this question. Why couldn't they all be the same? And it's very simple. Uh, all these public clouds were developed by people who were forced to make things work. And uh, they had a certain limitation, which is we have to accept ethernet packets from the virtual machines, but they also had huge scalability goals. So they have to deal with millions of servers and tens, if not hundreds of millions of endpoints. Now try do, doing that with your favorite control plane, be it eVPN or VPLS or what have you. It simply wouldn't work. Also, you can't afford to have a bridging loop or a flooding event in a public cloud. I know of so-called public cloud providers, they are way smaller than these two, who managed to bring down whole data centers because of a bridging loop caused by, for example, a VPC bug or what have you, or in some cases, even a technician you know, inserting uh, the same cable into two pores and the pores weren't protected with a uh, VPDU guard or something. So these people tried to solve massive scalability problems. And so they got to this software-based switching implementations. Obviously, because they had the same environment, they got to similar conclusions. And interestingly, AWS and Azure were very similar a few years ago. And then AWS diverged into this mixed layer two, layer three model to support the static routes on virtual machines. Uh, it looks like they were not willing to support more specific prefixes in VPCs, which Azure did to solve that same problem. So, you know, they started somewhere, they converged. It's like a sort of convergent evolution. And then they started diverging again, fixing the same problem in different ways. Now, what are the consequences of this? If you mastered AWS, you don't know much about Azure and vice versa, which means that if you want to master two or three public clouds, you won't spend three, time as much, uh, th three times as much time because uh, obviously things do repeat themselves and everyone is using IPsec and BGP on the outside, so we are good there. But on the other hand, everyone promising you this umbrella multi-cloud magical thing is, is uh, probably uh, somewhere between delusional and lying. Unless, of course, they give you the least common denominator of all public clouds they support, in which case, you know, why, why should you bother? So, if you do want to deploy in multiple clouds and there are people who are forced to do that, then you will have to have 
tooling specific for individual cloud environments. And if you take a look at real life tools like Terraform or Ansible, neither one of them allows you to deploy the same infrastructure on Azure and uh, Google and AWS. You have specific plugins for each cloud or specific modules if you're, we're talking about Ansible for each cloud and you have to change everything in your infrastructure definition if you're using Terraform, for example, and want to go from Azure to AWS, for example. Uh, I'm pretty sure that there is someone out there claiming that with containers and Kubernetes, it will be much better and it will be a perfect world and we'll all happily live ever after. On the other hand, I tried to get someone to talk about Kubernetes networking in uh, public cloud in our online course and no one I know wanted to touch that dumpster fire. Everyone said, it's changing so quickly, I don't want to waste my time talking about that. Let's wait for it to stabilize. I hope your experiences are better, but this is what I've heard and I simply didn't bother checking. So what can you do? First of all, don't trust anyone. Whoever is showing you great PowerPoint slide decks is, let's say, misrepresenting reality, most probably. So it's time for the red pill. It's time to accept that things are complex. It's time to accept that you will have to start from scratch and relearn whatever you think you know and uh, things work differently. As always, start with the fundamentals. The way I figured out how Azure and AWS work uh, was very simple. You create a VPC or a VNet, you create a few subnets, you create a few virtual machines, you start pinging, you start uh, creating ARP requests, you start taking packet traces, eventually you figure out what's going on behind the scenes. You change the IP address on the virtual machine, it's disconnected, you have to kill it. You change the MAC address, it's disconnected, you have to kill it. So you learn the hard way what works and what doesn't work. They, everything more or less works the same and if you understand Ethernet and IP, you will be good to go apart from the differences I already explained. But you know, that's nothing new in IT because if you look at any database product out there, each database product has a slightly different way of doing things. They couldn't even agree on the same syntax for simple SQL quer queries. So for example, limiting the number of records you get back from a database uses a different syntax in every major database product. So why should networking be different? Also, having things that look the same but behave slightly differently is nothing new in this world. Uh, I still remember from my high school days, I, we were briefly taught about alternate ge uh, geometries. So if the space is not flat, then you either could do multiple parallels to a single line or no parallel to a single line, whereas in flat space, you can only do one. So there's nothing new in this world. We always were facing with things that looked like they were coming from a different planet. And well, we're just experiencing that now with public cloud. Another thing you should do is always ask why. When someone is telling you, I need you to do X, you should always ask why, and try to go back, try to go back to the original business problem they're trying to solve. Because usually when a networking engineer gets a request, it has been filtered through so many people who edit their own, oh, let's push this down the stack so my life will be simpler perspective that in the end you are asked to implement crazy stuff like migrating virtual machines into a public cloud just because someone tried to make their life easier. So always keep asking why until you get to the 
actual business problem. You will have to learn many new things. On the other hand, you will also discover that you already know a lot of these things. The moment you start connecting public clouds to on-premises data centers, you're back into VPN, IPsec, BGP game, and you all know that. So I'm pretty sure that eventually you'll get there, you'll nail it, you'll master the public cloud, and uh, if nothing else, that will either make you a hero or enhance your career prospects. And that's all I had for today. And if there are any questions, I would love to hear them. Ivan, thank you so much indeed. Uh, we have two questions, if you're willing to take them now. Sure. If you'd like. Okay, cool. Um, so the first question was, have you found many people trying to build overlays to sidestep the cloud routing constraints akin to things like backplane.io, which is shut down, or uh, Istio, uh, or that style of approach? So building uh, ho host-based overlays. Uh, yes, of course. Uh, there's nothing you can't solve by another layer of indirection. Uh, if you want to go that way, sure, uh, you can do that. Uh, VMware is doing that same thing with VMware on AWS because effectively they're running NSXT on bare metal instances on AWS and they're using Geneve between the bare metal instances. Uh, they had to fight really hard against the realities of public cloud, like an instance can only have this many IP addresses and uh, they couldn't influence the routing in the public cloud. So they had to deploy many, many dirty tricks to make it work. But if your overlay product would be more amenable to what a public cloud can do, Obviously, you can always deploy an overlay and, you know, just add another layer of abstraction. Anyway, overlays have been here forever. And I, I don't know what the big deal is today because uh, that's how my kid has been playing Minecraft with his buddies for the last 10 years. Uh, on the Istio side, Istio is a different story, as I if I understand it correctly. It's a service mesh. It's really management of load balancers attached to every container or uh, VM. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to manage who can talk to whom in the microservices architecture. And they're doing that by intercepting TCP sessions, unless I totally got it wrong, which is obviously possible. So I wouldn't really call Istio an overlay product, but yeah, there are others out there. Gotcha. Excellent. Uh, and the other one was, are you seeing any real or meaningful movement to the use of lambdas and serverless to, to get over these constraints also? Uh, you see, in the end, it's all, in the end, there are always virtual machines in the background because uh, cloud just means someone else is running the hardware. And serverless just means uh, you outsource the sysadmin. It's all running on virtual machines and those virtual machines need IP addresses and those IP addresses need, it to, need to be connected to your on-premises or your internet-based clients. And you need to put a load balancer in front of that and you need to protect them with security groups if needed. So in the end, you have to solve the same set of problems. You have to have some protection, which can be either web application firewall or whatever it's called, and security groups, network access control list, whatever that's called. Uh, you need some load balancer in front, whether it's visible or not, doesn't matter. You need some backhaul to your on-premises data center, be it VPN or lease line. You need BGP on top of that. Unless, of course, you are a startup and you go for cloud only, in which case, you know, it's a totally different discussion. So, yes, you might get away from a few things by using... Uh, serverless or lambdas or whatever you want to call that. But in the end, 
someone still has to move and protect the bits and bytes.